Thank you so much, choir, and good evening, everybody. It's good to see everybody here tonight, those that are visiting with us. I see we have some visitors from Nassau, some from South Carolina. So good to have each and every one of you here tonight. Maybe others that are here, we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we trust that tonight will be a special night in your life as you listen to the special music, a challenge from God's word if you're unsaved, that this will be the night when you give your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so glad you're here tonight, and we're going to continue to sing about that. Because he lives, we live also. Turn in your chorus book. We're going to rise and sing number 186, and then we're going to remain standing for 352 in the Redemption Songbook. 186, he lives. We're going to sing the first verse in chorus. The, the, the first verse is not there, but we all know it. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Okay, so let's rise and sing that and then remain standing for 352. <clears throat>
Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you so much for that good singing. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? My Father in heaven, we're so thankful today that our Savior arose triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And what a privilege it is to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we think back of many, many years ago when your son went to that cross and he suffered, bled, and died that we might have eternal life. And we're so thankful that he came with one purpose in mind was that to go to that cross and to give men and women in the entire world an opportunity whereby that they can go to heaven by giving up his life on that cross. And we're so thankful today that the plan of salvation is still open, free to all that will come. Father, and we pray that if there be any in our midst tonight that know not the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal way, that they would just stop and think tonight of where they're going to spend eternity. Father, may they realize that the day of grace is fast coming to a close and how sad it will be to go out into a lost eternity without Christ. Father, we pray for our land. We pray for those that may be listening, watching by way of television. Father, we just pray for this entire Bahama land tonight. We thank you for this country that we live in and for the freedom that we have to preach forth the glorious message of the gospel. And we pray that as those listen tonight that thy Holy Spirit would take the words tonight and would convict men and women of their lost condition. Bless Brother Nate as he comes, Father, and in a little while to bring forth a message for thee. And we pray that you'll give him the li liberty and <clears throat> freedom that he needs tonight. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would convict men and women of their lost condition, Father, that they will make this night their night before it be forever too late. We just pray that you will continue to bless each face of this service, the singing, special selections, Father, those that will be taking part in any way. And we give thee thanks and praise for thy goodness to us and being with us throughout another day. And as we continue to <clears throat> celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. May our hearts be overwhelmed and, and rejoice in what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us many, many years ago. Bless us now as we further wait in thy presence, praying that thy name will be magnified and glorified tonight, for we ask it in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> like I said, it's so good to see everybody here tonight. And again, a challenge to those that will be watching by way of television as this service will be rebroadcast later on. We trust you'll stay tuned and listen tonight, and you too will be encouraged and blessed. And if you're unsaved, that this will be the time when you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ while you have time and opportunity. Right now, we're going to be favored with a few selections. The first one is a duet, The Old Rugged Cross Made a Difference, followed by Firm Foundation, because he lives. T'was a life filled with aimless desperation Without hope walk the shell of a man Just one touch, then a new life began. And the old ragged cross made the difference. In a life bound for heartache and defeat, I will pray.
There's a room filled with sad, ashen faces. Without hope, death has wrapped them in gloom. But at the sight of a saint, there's rejoicing. For life can't be saved. back in 1970 by Bill and Gloria Gaither who wrote over 700 songs but this one came at a tough time in their life see it was a time when they had just gone through a lot of disease uh, Bill was coming through mono and uh, there were wars and rumors of wars going on this was a time when God is dead was being promoted in the classrooms and this was a time when uh, when when things seemed to be going completely counter scriptural sounds like a lot today and it was at that point that Bill and Gloria heard the news that they were expecting a child. And one of their first thoughts about this child was, how can we bring a kid into this world, into this wicked, perverse world? And the thought came to their heart, because he lives. And it's the second verse that they wrote in response to this news. How sweet to hold our newborn baby and feel the pride and joy she gives but greater still that calm assurance this child can face uncertain because he Way to bed. 
so much Bill and Caleb for that wonderful duet and also firm foundation because he lives life is worth the living just because he lives hallelujah what a savior we serve choir is coming now with their last selection for the evening day three Amazed at what they find, they quickly run to spread the word. Day three, he is alive. Just so good to be here, so good to see you here tonight and we're taking the time to be with us. And right now it's my privilege to call on our brother Nate Bremson for whatever God has laid in his heart for us tonight. And what a thrilling uh, evening to come and to remember the Lord. And I believe that you're going to be thrilled by his word. And when I say thrilled by his word, I'm not talking about because of any messenger. I'm talking because his word is living. And if we come to his word as anything but living, we're not approaching his word with the honor that it's due. And so let's be expectant upon God as we come to his word this evening. And so I want to begin just with a word of... Let's the Holy Spirit just focus on you. It would be very easy to think about the person sitting next to you. And your parents are listening. But I want to suggest to you that God wants to speak to you this evening. And if that's the case, then we know 
He's going to change your life. So let's pray that this would happen. And as I pray, I want you to just talk to the Lord and ask him to have his way in you tonight. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask you to work. And the reason for there is no power. Without you, Father, we can't change a life. You see, only, Father, it's through your strength that we're made new. It's through the blood, the body of Jesus Christ by which we're transformed. And so tonight, as we come to your word, I'm asking you, please, do a mighty work in this place. And Father, start in my life. Lord, I know there's a lot of things in, in me that they don't look like Jesus. And I know that your word is intended to change those things. So Father, please work. And if I say anything which is not of your Holy Spirit, please have mercy and wipe it out of everybody's minds. And when we leave these doors at the end, may all glory, every bit of glory, may it go to the Lord Jesus Christ who's worthy. We pray this all in his name. Amen. We have a passage of scripture which I find absolutely thrilling. And you can go and turn your Bibles to it. It's in Matthew chapter 8, and it'll be the first four verses. And you say, that's not an Easter portion of scripture. Don't worry. We're going to get there, okay? It's going to completely reside on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, as you go there, uh, let me paint a little picture for you of a common phobia that many of us have. Now, I will say straight out, I don't have this phobia, but I love to mess up people that do have this phobia. And you'll, if you know me very well, you already know this is the case, and that's people that are germaphobic, all right? Um, it, it, you can't live in the part of the world where I live and be germaphobic and have any kind of sanity just because, simply put, it doesn't happen. Plus, when you're working with hundreds upon hundreds of children a day that live in a village um, where they're are no uh, you know, restrooms and homes and where uh, food is oftentimes just on the street and whatever the case is, let's just say germs oftentimes are not your first concern in life. But that said, um, I remember back growing up in, uh, not growing up, but working in Cairo, Egypt with street children, and there would be times that these kids would I, I'd just be hanging out with them and, and uh, you know, sharing the gospel and whatnot, and sometimes they would buy food on the street. And I, I remember staring at their grubby hands. I mean, they're, they're caked with, with just stuff from the street, you know. And they would take these, like, sweet potatoes they'd buy off the street, and they would break it in half, and they would give me a portion of it. And I'll tell you, that's one of the most special meals I've ever eaten, knowing that here are children sacrificing on the street to give me half of their meal. And we would sit on the streets of Cairo and eat together. But I'll tell you, the last thing that, that we could think about in that context was germs, all right? Because honestly, if that was the case, well, uh, there would be problems. Now, even further than that, in our world today, we have a lot of other, other concerns. And oftentimes, our life is all about protecting our environment. An issue that came up this past year is Ebola. And I'm sure you all have heard much about Ebola. It was constantly on the news, constantly people uh, throwing it my way, saying, hey, are you safe from Ebola? Now, let me just be honest with you. Ebola's not in Niger, okay? It's not in the country where I'm living. It's, it's been next door, but it hasn't been in that country. But people constantly were saying, hey, are you safe? Are you safe? Are you safe? Let me tell you straight out, I'm safe, but not because I don't have Ebola. I'm safe because Jesus Christ saved me from my sin, and I know where I'm going when I die. But if we're going to live life just trying to stay away from germs, you say, what kind of message is this? Don't worry, we're getting to the gospel. Try to live a life just staying away from germs. Hello, is that really what God puts on earth? Go into all the world and make sure you don't contract any germs. Last time I checked, that's not a concern. So I finally, after months of hearing this, I wrote to all my friends. Maybe you read what I wrote because I put it out there for everyone. I said, I appreciate your concern but I would much rather contract Ebola, sharing it with someone who's going into eternity very soon, than let them go into eternity and me have Jesus Christ and live another few years in healthy life. And I'll tell you, when we come to the story tonight, I want you to see that there is an attack on this mode of thinking, and not so much germs physically, but germs spiritually, and you're going to see what happens. This, in my opinion, is one of the most power-packed stories and we only have 21 minutes to talk about it so let's get to work 
Matthew chapter 8. Now, in order to get a little bit of context, I want to read the last verse of the previous chapter, and then we'll move on into the first four verses. So five verses we're going to read. Ver actually, the last two verses of the previous chapter. So chapter 7, verse 28, here we go. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Verse 1 of chapter 8. When Jesus came down from the mountain, a great crowd followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Uh, let's start off by just understanding what's going on in this story. The first thing I want you to see is the place that this takes place. The place of the story. What does it say? Jesus just finished a message, and we know what that message is. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, oftentimes coined by, I think, St. Augustine uh, many years ago. The Sermon on the Mount. Now, in that sermon, what did uh, Jesus say over and over and over? Obviously, he said a lot of things, but what did he say over and over and over? He said, you have heard that it was said to you, but I say to you. In other words, he was quoting the law of Moses, right? And then he'd say, now that's the law of Moses, but Clarence, there's more. I say to you this. Now, he says all these things. He reiterates the law. He sets the stage, and then he comes down from the mountain. Now, I want you guys to think back in your minds about what Jesus is, let's say, um, replaying. Because a, a Jewish revolutionary would usually give his speeches in the mountains, okay? This was a very common principle. Why? Because if it was in the mountains, then uh, people wouldn't come and find him easily, and he would usually be somewhat safe. And then in the process, uh, you know, crowds could gather, and then they would come down from the mountains, and they would take action. Got it? So Jesus is coming down from the mountain. He's ready for action. Well, I want you to see what his first action is when he comes down from the mountain. Does he go into the synagogue and preach? Does he go and make some public statement that causes a stir? No, he comes from down from the mountain and he encounters a certain individual who has leprosy. Now, hold all that in your minds for a second. Go back to the first lawgiver. Who was the first lawgiver? Moses, right? Now, when Moses gave the law in Exodus chapter 20 all the way to chapter 3, when God gave the law to Moses more appropriately, in Exodus chapter 32, Moses comes down from the mountain. Now, when Moses comes down from the mountain, do you guys remember what he found? He found the children of Israel disobeying, right? And what did they do? They had built a golden calf. And when Moses saw that golden calf, oh, he was angry. And we know he broke the, broke the stones the commandments were on. And then uh, God wanted just to destroy the people, and Moses pleaded for them. You can read all this in Exodus 32, verses 7 to 20. But in verse 20, it's very interesting. Very interesting. This is appropriate for Easter. In verse 20, you know what happens in Exodus 32? It says that they ground up the statue and they drank it. Do we teach that in Sunday school? Not very often. They ground it up and they drank it. They had to drink their very sin. Do you get that? They had to drink their very sin. I want you to hold on to that thought because, my friends, tonight I got good news for you. You don't have to drink your sin. But the very symbol of their sin, that golden calf, they drank that night. But now we come to Jesus, the second lawgiver. He comes down off a mountain having just given his law. And let me tell you, his law damns us as well <laughs> because we can't keep the things he said in Matthew chapter 5 to 7. But he comes down from the mountain. And what happens? He encounters this man, this person who has leprosy. We have the place, but now we have a problem. What is the problem? A leper. Now, let me, let, let me get, get this clear with you guys. There was nothing worse than leprosy in that day to ostracize someone from society. In fact, there, was a, there were laws. If Nico had leprosy. Now, first of all, none of us could be within six feet of him. Period. Got it? So you can't even be in this room because there's nowhere in this room where you're going to accept way up there where you'd be six feet from everybody. If the wind was blowing, do you know what the law was? 
135 feet away from someone. 135 feet. Can you imagine always being 135 feet? Just do the logic. He had no family life. He had no societal belongings. He had no connections in the community. When someone got leprosy, let's just be, let's say, it, say what it is. They were dead. They were dead. They were dead to everything. They simply were living a living death. And here is a man who had leprosy. Please, let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not make it anything that it's not. And what happens? Jesus comes down from the mountain. And what does he immediately see? He sees this leper. And the leper is crying out to him. And the leper says, Lord. <laughs> well, look what he says, though. If you will, you can make me clean. I want you to see something. There's no invitation given by Jesus, is there? It's not like Jesus is like, hey, 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 any lepers out there? Any lepers? I, I'm, I'm healing leprosy today. Two for one deal. Bring your friend. No, there's, there's none of that. But this leper has heard about Jesus. He's heard about the other healings that went on. He's heard about the power. And I want you to see in a second, he hasn't just heard about Jesus. He knows who Jesus is. And he knows Jesus isn't just someone who can heal leprosy. Jesus is something more. And I'll tell you in a minute why I believe that to be true from the word of God in verse 4. But we see him right away. He says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And this is his plea. But notice his actions. What's the first thing? He does three things. Look at his worship. Look at this man's worship. What's his worship? His worship is he knelt before him. He knelt. Now, if, if you kneel before like a, a non-God in Scripture, what, what, what will they say to you? They say, get up. Don't worship me. If you knelt before an angel, they would say, no, no, don't worship me. I'm an angel just sent from God. But notice, this man kneels and worships, and Jesus doesn't say, hey, stop worshiping. Because this man recognizes who Jesus is. Look at his worship. But I want to get to maybe what's one of the most thrilling parts of this whole story. I want you to see his words. What are his words? His words are these. He says, if you will, you can make me clean. Okay, notice what he didn't say. He says, he didn't say, if you can, will you make me clean? He didn't say that, did he? There's nothing about if Jesus can. Do you recognize here in this passage, this is not about the power of God. It, God can make him clean. He knew that Jesus Christ was more than a prophet. He knew that Jesus Christ was more than a good man. He knew that Jesus Christ was God. And he didn't say, if you can. He said, if you will. If you want to, you can make me clean. I've got amazing news tonight for you. God wants to make us clean. Okay, hang on a second. Because I think a lot of us have more trouble believing in a loving God than in a powerful God. I really think so. I, I think if we, if we on, we're honest with ourselves, well, I mean, I could ask most of you, do you believe God's all-powerful? You'll say yes all day. Do you believe God's all-powerful? Yes. Do you believe God's all-powerful? Yes. Like, I don't think we struggle with that in this room. I don't think so. I think you guys really believe God's all-powerful, and I know I do. Oh, but we struggle with the love of God. We say, if you will, you can make me clean. Guys, God's more willing to make you clean than you are to be clean. You know how I know that? I see a middle cross. I see a cross where Jesus Christ paid everything for you. If you ever doubt the love of God, look at the cross. I don't know what you're dealing with in your life, but I'll tell you, it's nothing compared to what Christ paid for you. Nothing. It's not even worth talking about. I do not care. I don't care if you've been a drug addict since the womb because of your mom. I don't care if you haven't had a day of your life where you haven't been hooked on alcohol. I don't care if you haven't had a day of your life where uh, you've been freed from bad relationships. I'll tell you, none of that's even worth talking about in comparison to the power that Jesus is about to display in this story. I don't know what you're bringing to the table. All I know is it's nothing compared to the power of Jesus Christ and his love to heal you tonight. And I know that's true because I see the cross. And then I see an empty tomb. 
He says, if you will, if you will, you can make me clean. Those are his words. Do you remember back in Naaman? Naaman got leprosy in 2 Kings chapter 5. And when Naaman got leprosy, what did, what did Naaman get? He, he, he heard there's a prophet in Israel that can heal you, right? And so he writes a letter, but he doesn't send it to the prophet, does he? He sends it to the king, and that ticks the king off. Because what does the king say? What's the first thing? He says, am I God? In other words, you're writing me about leprosy? Like I can do anything about this disease? Jesus doesn't say that, does he? When he's asked, hey, if you will, you can make me clean. I love Jesus' response. So simple. We're going to come back to this person because we want to look at his worship and his words. There's one more thing we want to look at, but not yet. I want you to see Jesus' response. What does Jesus say? He says, I will be clean. I will be clean. Something happened here. Look further. Don't miss this. If you're sleeping, wake up. Now you can go back to sleep later. Look at this. It says, Jesus stretched out his hand. What does it say? And touched him. What just went on? The Son of God came and he touched him. You say, why are you getting so excited about this? You're going to get excited about this too in just a minute. He could have said, hey, leper, you know, I'm still six feet away from you. Just to, you know, keep the law good and all this. Be cleansed. He didn't. Jesus doesn't have to touch to heal. The next story, he speaks and the guy's healed. But he chooses to touch. And I want to suggest a crazy, powerful thing to each one of you tonight. See, Jesus was showing there's a new power in town. And watch this. Up until this point in all of history, all of history, every single day of history, up until this point, if somebody took their hand and they touched a leper, any time they touched a leper, what happened? Every time they were made unclean. You get that? Every single time. But I want you to see something happens in this passage. For the first time, we see a leper touched. And what happened? There was a greater contagion in town. There was something more contagious than leprosy, and it's the healing power of my Jesus. You get that? He came, and he touched the most serious illness that existed on earth. And the second he touched it, that man's leprosy was gone because something more powerful than leprosy had come to town. I know you're just reading the story in your scriptures, but do you see the implications of this today? What I want you to see is, I don't know what you're dealing with, but I do know that the power of Jesus Christ is far more powerful than anything you bring into the table. All it takes is his touch, and his touch will heal. But my friends, I'm not so much talking about a physical ailment. Yeah, he can touch that and heal that easily. That's not a big deal. We see people healed very frequently in places. Now, let me just tell you something about that, lest you get the wrong idea. People know about Jesus because we tell them. And we tell them straight out, Jesus is God. And people will come frequently and they'll say, hey, if Jesus is God, then he can probably make me well. Say, yeah, absolutely, he can, he can easily make you well. But you understand, that's not your biggest problem right now. Your biggest problem is your soul. And you know what? We'll share the gospel. We'll say, if you want, we'll pray. We'll talk to Jesus. We got no power. We can't heal you. I can touch you and it's not going to do anything but I can just talk to my father in heaven and I can ask him and he certainly can touch you and you'll be made well. And, and you know, they'll say, please do that. I say, you understand who we're talking to, right? The savior of the world, the one who died for you. And we just give him the gospel and they say, please. And we'll talk. We don't do anything. We don't raise our voice. We don't make it dramatic. Just, just talk. I say, God, you know Muhammad right here and you know what's his problem. And I know he needs to accept Jesus Christ as his savior most of all, but would you show him your power? Would you show him Jesus is the Son of God? Would you just touch him? Tell you, people are healed. That's not a big deal. But there's a big deal in this room tonight. A huge deal. And my friends, I don't intend to sugarcoat anything, and I also don't intend to make it my priority to make friends. I love you, but because I love you, I want to speak truth. And the truth of God's word is that we have been corrupted with a disease far 
worse than leprosy. Far worse. I know a lot of us don't think that. We think, oh, you know, my, my, my sin, whatever, it's, it's bad, but it's not that bad. My friends, your sin will send you to an eternity in hell. And not because God's sending you there, because you're rejecting what he offers you. He says, whosoever will may come. Jesus did say, right? I mentioned this on Tuesday night. Jesus did say that nobody can come to him unless the Father calls him. But then he, what did he say? Or unless the Father draws him. But what does he say a few chapters later? He says, if I am lifted up, I'm going to draw everybody to myself. John chapter 12. And in John 19, we know he was lifted up. My friends, he drew all of you to himself. He called you. He paid for you. He offers his touch to your life tonight. And you know, all you have to do is what this leper did. It's so simple to be saved. So simple. Now, here's the thing, though. Let me just ask you a, a very simple question. Very simple, but answer it. And answer it out loud. Don't be silent about this. Was the leper the same after he was touched? Yes or no? Oh, you're sleeping. Hello. Wake up. Let's try it again. Was the leper the same after he was touched by Jesus? No, not at all. He was a new man. I don't think he, I don't think he was just like cleansed where his leprosy was gone. I think his arms regrew. I think his legs were whole. I don't think he had splotches on his face. He was a new man. Let me tell you that when Jesus Christ touches a life with the power of his good news that he died for you and rose again for you, you will not be the same. And that is why I'm concerned here tonight because some of you have put your rear end in one of these seats for years and years and years, but your life doesn't look a thing different. And I'm wondering, has Jesus touched you or has religion touched you? Jesus didn't make you go up on the mountain and reach his high peak of values. He came down and got dirty. And he took, his, he took the leprosy of this man because he says, you know what? I'm taking that leprosy and I'm dying for the brokenness in this world. It says that he bore our sicknesses and diseases. See, Christ took that for us, my friends. This is not about us doing anything to earn our salvation. This is about us in desperation saying, Jesus, save me. But I'll tell you, don't act like you're bringing anything to the table. You're a leper condemned to die and distanced from any relationship with God. But Jesus, he loves you. He's more willing than you for you to be saved tonight. I'm serious. Uh, some of you, your pride is going to send you to hell because you are not willing to stand up in front of people that have seen you all their life because you're afraid of what they're going to think. I just want you to look around at somebody and say, seriously, I'm going to go to hell because I care what they think. It might be someone in this room that's over 70 years old that's been here since they were a child. And it might be somebody who's about five or six years old that needs to be saved tonight. And what is salvation? Salvation is saying, Lord, make me clean. Forgive me. Save me. Just save me. Don't bring anything to the table. Just call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Easter is all about. Easter is about Jesus won. He won. It's over. The battle is finished. There'll be no more war. You see, the enemy, he's still fighting, but he already lost. And you can have victory tonight in your life. Just say, Jesus, touch me. Jesus, save me. And let me tell you, he's not going to renovate your life. He's going to give you a new life. It's called his life. Let me ask you straight out. Please just be honest. Please be honest with yourself. I'm not asking for a verbal response right now, but you better respond. Have you been made new? Can you point back to that day when Jesus touched you? Do you know, like, do you know without any doubt that you were touched by Jesus? Have you been saved? If tonight is your final night on earth, and I, we're 2015 now, right? I've already lost four close friends this year, all young. The old one was like 36. The rest were younger. They weren't sick before 2015 came around. One of them just tried a gymnastics move, fell on their head, and died right there, 12-year-old. Others on the mission field, random places, got a sickness, gone. Guys, are you really going to risk your eternity by saying, Jesus, I want you to touch me next week? 
you know what? Some of you are like, I've made professions before. It didn't work. <laughs> it's not about it didn't work. Don't bring anything to the table. We're not looking for Jesus to shift things around in your life. We're coming to him depleted, broken, hurting, sick, disgusting, a sinner. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless lamb of God is he. Full atonement, not partial atonement, full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a savior. My friends, tonight can be the night where everything changes in your life. It can be that. But for some of you, you're going to say, I'm not ready. I'm going to give you news. You'll never be ready. If that's your answer tonight, you will never be ready to be saved because you can't do anything to get ready. You've got to be lost and know it. That's all. Are you willing to humble yourselves before God and say tonight, Lord, touch me. Can I point out one thing to you? I have a minute left. One thing in this passage, verse 4. What does Jesus say to him? Go show yourself to the priest and don't say anything to anyone. Does he go to the priest? We don't see him go to the priest. You know why? I think he was declaring something. Who's Jesus? Jesus is our high priest. I think this guy, when he said, go show yourself to the priest, he looked at Jesus as like, I get it. I just did. I just did. I just showed myself to the high priest right then and there. In fact, the high priest is the one that touched me. Friends, to be saved is the farthest thing from religion. To be saved is to accept the relationship that God extends to you through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Guys, this is Easter. This is Resurrection Day. But let me ask you. I said this, uh, was it this morning, right? I said, I think, I think we need warnings on our tombs if we belong to Jesus, right? We need warnings saying, watch out, because when Christ comes again, this tomb's going to break open. If you're nearby, you might get hurt. Because I'm not afraid of death. Amen. I've been seconds from it before. And I'll tell you, you come to that moment of death, it's not a big deal. But what is a huge deal is going to death with your sin. I'm the farthest thing from a perfect person. I'm broken. I'm messed up. And you know, I still have struggles in my life. But you know, my struggles don't define me anymore. Because I have a Savior. And I haven't come to him saying, I've got anything to offer. I came to him saying, Lord, if you're willing, save me. And he says, I'm not willing. Anybody should perish, so I save you. Is that you tonight? I'm done. I'm not going to go on and on with this. But if the Holy Spirit's convicting you, I want you all just to bow your heads. I'm going to close in prayer, but, you know, I'm going to give an invitation. <clears throat> and you know what? Some of you guys might say, why do we need an invitation? Because I say, the Holy Spirit's convicting you, and if you pass by this moment, you may never be saved. This could be your only chance ever to come to a Savior. And let me tell you, whether you come to God or not, that's between you and Him. But He's given us good news, and it's an announcement, and it's saying, I love you, I've paid for you, and I want you. And so, I want to ask you to do something. I'm going to pray. But I'm not going to ask you to come forward, although if you do get touched by Jesus Christ, I do believe that you should tell everybody. Because how on earth can you be a leper and go home and all of a sudden just not tell? Everyone's going to see. If you're not going around telling everybody that you've been saved... Chances are you're not saved. I know that's a strong statement to make. All I'm saying is if you're not confessing Jesus Christ, I don't know what Jesus you met, but he's a Jesus you're going to want to tell others about. If that's you, and if you're convicted tonight, I want to pray for you, and I want to know who you are so afterwards we can talk to you. Eyes are closed. Not that that's important. They could all be open. But if tonight you need to be touched by Jesus, 
Simply put, if you need to be saved, and again, I don't care if you've been in this pew every single Sunday of your life, tonight might be the night you need to get saved. Will you be touched by Jesus? I want you to stand where you're at so I can pray for you. And afterwards, we can talk to you. It's not a show. If tonight you want to be touched by Jesus, stand where you're at. And then I'm just going to pray. And I'm going to identify you. But you know who you are. Father, you know exactly what you're doing in this place tonight. And you know those who have been convicted. You know those who have yet to be touched by the healing power of Jesus Christ. And Father, nobody in this room can save anybody. We can say magic words. We can't say magic words. We, we can't do a magic touch. We can't do anything. We're powerless, but you are all powerful. And Father, tonight I believe that you want to save souls to the uttermost. And so I'm praying, Father, whoever it is in this room that has yet to confess you as Savior, that as soon as this is over, they would come and they would give their life to Jesus Christ, who gave his life for them. Thank you for the power that is in Christ. Thank you that you don't make us climb the mountain to your perfection, but you came down to us and you bore our sin that we might be called sons and daughters of God. I know of nobody on earth more blessed. Do your thing, God. We pray it all for the glory and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.